During the last episode I made a fatal mistake. I introduced a bug into my code. If you haven't watched the previous episode, then I recommend that you do that just now. Maybe you can already spot the bug. What if I told you that this bug was on purpose? What if I told you that I did that just to lure you into thinking about static analysis and linters in Rust? Well, no, it was just a bug. But I still want to show you a few things that you can do to make your code more idiomatic and better, also containing less errors. I also want to talk a little bit about the difference between the into trade and the sref trade. All of this right after the intro. What is this bug, you might rightfully ask? I've opened the project here and when I try to compile it I get two warning messages and it, uh, it says unused variable pref consider using underscore pref instead. The error is in line 17 turns out I don't even use pref the compiler even told me I was wrong. At this point, thanks to Ole Martin Root for sending in a pull request to fix that. I want to show you how to fix it now. In many other languages, I would have done something like if matches get underscore C not equals oops pref return false. But if I tried to compile that, it would say expected borrow of chars and found a char. And the problem is that this is inside of an option. So I kind of need to match the two option types here. Turns out it's not as easy as adding an ampersand to the option type because, well, then we get a reference to an option, but we want to modify the inner type. Instead, Martin came up with a better idea, which also feels a bit more idiomatic. It looks like this. We match on a pattern. We get our two variables, matches get uh, borrow c and stack.pop. And then we match and if the pattern is some car and some pref, well, then we have what we can compare. And then in the condition, we need to dereference the pointer and compare it with pref. If that works and they are equal, then we just do nothing. Otherwise we return false. Not bad. And with this, we can add another test, which checks for a condition where we only have a closing parenthesis. And all looks good. But can we do better? Well, one thing we can do is splitting up the successful and the non-successful tests. So let's move all the false ones to the bottom. Move them out of here. Have a function called uh, invalid data, test invalid data. Ah, let's just call it test invalid. Get rid of this. We call this test valid. Maybe get rid of some spacing. Produces the same result, of course. Now there's a lot of redundancy here. We can get rid of this by putting this the tests into a vector. Let's do some magic here. Vec.
command and option and down arrow and then some vim magic Now we have our valid data and we iterate over it for test in valid data. Move that up here and we test uh, that here. We say true. Cargo test, all good. We do the same at the bottom. Sweet, but can we do better? Notice how the pattern changes when I add a successful test to one of our failing tests here. So let's say I have an opening and a closing parenthesis, which is successfully balanced, but then when I run it, boom, I get an error. Problem is that I cannot really know which of those patterns, which of those patterns here were invalid. The only thing I know is that I have a failing test. Um, left is true, right is false, and the test is called test invalid. That doesn't really say much. So I would have to split up all the tests into separate unit tests to be able to know which one failed. Or there's a magic trick which I don't know of, and please comment something if you know a trick on how to do that. But in any case, it's probably a good idea to split up those unit tests anyway. It's just a lot of typing. Fortunately, this is where macros can come in. In PHP, those things are called data providers. Uh, here's some documentation. You can see that we have a data test which extends our test case. And we use a data provider here. In this case, it's the addition provider. And the addition provider just returns an array of arrays and each array is one test case and the data for this test case will be inserted into our unit test here. So dollar $A, dollar $B and dollar expected. Those are the values. And then we can just run assertions on it. Unfortunately, right now, I don't know of any such testing framework for Rust but there are some workarounds to make this work with macros. And there are quite a few people that use this pattern in their own libraries and crates, and they call it parametri parametrized tests. Here's a Stack Overflow post, and Chris Morgan, and also Shapmaster, they provide an example for a macro to do exactly this. Each macro, no, each element in the macro gets a name and the input parameters. And this little magic thing up here will generate the code for us. Let's just try to use that right, right now. So I copied over. Gonna call it parameterized. And I'm gonna call my balance method on the input. Yeah, and then I can remove this block here. Call that parameterized. And for each and every element, I will come up with a proper description. So that's gonna be empty. And a colon here. simple parenthesis multiple brackets nested brackets 
And this test actually makes no sense because it tests exactly the same thing, just some nested brackets, I guess. Let's get rid of that. And we don't need this part anymore. Also not this anymore. Then we define our outcome. So all of this will be a successful test. Okay, and now the only thing we need to do is get rid of our failing test, which we introduced, save it, and run it, and ta-da, much nicer syntax. Okay, we do the same for our failing tests after some cleanup. <laughs> Okay. I adjusted the formatting a little bit and now it looks quite nice. Let me just quickly explain what happens in the macro. This first block defines our input parameters. You can see that there's a dollar in front of the variable names here to separate those from normal Rust code and name is the first parameter which is just an identifier so you can think of it as some kind of string and then there's value which is an expression so that's something more sophisticated the star means that this pattern can be used multiple times and for each input parameter we create this block of rust code dollar name is the identifier and then we extract a tuple from our dollar value here and then we just run the assertion it's not too sophisticated but it's on the other side very powerful and easy to understand but can we do even better of course we can another one of my viewers apart Goratit had a nice idea to use asref instead of the into trade. At the top here in our function, we have this into string type requirement. And he rightfully said that this is not necessary because we don't want to take ownership of the string, we just want a read only view of a string type it can be a stir or a string and what he suggested was to replace into string with as ref stir now in line 11 instead of saying into we can say as ref and when we compile that we get exactly the same result Internally, though, we don't allocate another own string object on the heap. Instead, we use our read-only view, which is kind of beautiful. Now, I'm not saying that in this example, this makes a huge difference. But if you do a lot of string allocations, that can be of a concern, especially in embedded systems. So it's well worth to check out the documentation on the into trade and the sref trade and also on the cow trade which is clone on write which is something in between into and sref in a sense that it takes ownership of an ob object when we need it and otherwise it will use a read only view so a nice trade off between the two one thing you can do since Rust 126 is to use Impultrade and that makes our code example a bit nicer. So instead of saying T as refster input is of type T, we can also say input implements something that is as ref 
is true. And we can get rid of this whole thing in its entirety. Compile it. Isn't that beautiful? Now at this point our code is already much better and much less error prone. I guess it serves as a good example on how to incrementally improve your code and make it more idiomatic and more ergonomic to use. And with that said, thank you very much for watching and I see you in the next episode. But if you have some time, then please consider donating on Patreon so that I can keep up the show. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.